Welcome everyone to another recording of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. As always, we're here to keep you up to date with the latest news, tech, content and wisdom from the world of marketing. And as always, my co-host is a man on a mission to demystify digital marketing. He's the host of the Content Marketing Studio video podcast. Please welcome Mr. Pascal Fintoni. Well, thank you so much for this introduction. And can I just say what a pleasure it is to spend more time with Roger Edwards, who is also the man on a mission to keep marketing simple, the voice of the Marketing and Finance Podcast and the host of the Roger Video Series, and now the author of a brand new book, Cats, Mats and Marketing Plans. Welcome to the show. Oh, Pascal, thank you for that little shout out. Yes, the book is launched on the 2nd of November. So by the time you listen to this show, it will be out there. Fantastic. Now, we're both men on missions and our mission today, should we choose to accept it, is to take you through the usual sets of formats. And we're going to go straight into the first section of the show, which is in the news. And we begin with TikTok, who has made this first foray into e-commerce with a deal with Shopify that will enable consumers to buy products directly from the platform. And Marks and Spencers has axed its Christmas ad for its clothing division this year. They plan some online and influencer activity to promote its clothing and homewares, but the brand's primary marketing focus for the festive season this year will now be on food. Right, well, Facebook has released its new Oculus Quest 2 VR at the low price of $299. It is getting strong reviews thanks to awe inspiring games and immersive experiences, perhaps signaling that VR may become mainstream. Dream. Fennec, the chain of UK department stores, use Facebook live streaming to reveal their iconic Christmas window. The online event included a look into the creative process, insider interviews, plus an appearance from Santa on the roof. Well, O2 has joined forces with charity Hubbub to provide vulnerable people with 10,000 smartphones donated by members of the public to help them keep in touch with family and access essential services. Listen to this, Pascal. In quarter three, 2020, YouTube brought in $5 billion in ad revenue and 30 million premium and music subscribers. Well, I've got some additional numbers for you, Roger, with Sweden-based Spotify, who remains uh, ahead of its main competitor, Apple Music, with a number of listeners going up 29% to 320 million. Spotify is said to end the year with over 345 million monthly active subscribers. Wow. And a 17-year-old sixth-form student from York duped many of the UK's leading news outlets by tweeting that Woolworths was returning to the high street as an experiment about the standard of fact-checking. Now, Pascal, I have to say that I got duped by that very tweet. I saw it and I thought, oh, Woolworths is coming back. Because where I grew up, Woolworths was on every street corner. Certainly was uh, in, uh, in the northeast of England. I used to go there to get my VHS cassettes back in the days because the prices was always competitive. But yes, um, I mean, the young lad, when he was interviewed, was mortally embarrassed because he didn't think that would work. He yeah. purposely made a very bad Twitter account full of spelling mistakes and very poor artwork, including a website that was frankly looking very, very dodgy. And yet, maybe because of the signs of the times, people rushed in. And uh, I mean, whilst, you know, a, a content consumer like you, Roger, could be forgiven to be duped, I'm not so sure I could be as kind for journalists. <laughs> yeah, the journalist should definitely be fact-checking. So what do you think of this Oculus Quest 2 VR headset? Now, I remember on your birthday, which was quite recently, that you got a VR headset of your own. Is it one of these? It's not the Facebook version, but it's only you know, a, a very close uh, clone, I would say. Um, and I mean, I'm very, very fond of VR and ER. Indeed, as you know, I launched recently a new video series to interview people working in there. But I'm just disappointed that it's not broken through. You know, all the promises mm. we heard maybe three, four years ago. You remember the, the big Facebook conference, indeed the Google conference, Roger. We were mm -hmm. promised uh, something, I think, and we were promised you know, ways in which we can market our products and services to our, our, our kind of audience. And it's just not come true. Do you think it is the fact that ultimately you've got to wear these rather 
I mean, this is quite a small headset, but it's still, you know, fairly sizable and it covers up your entire face. I, you know, VR headsets were just hailed a few years ago as going to be absolutely massive, you know, that revolutionize um, entertainment, maybe in the same way as 3D TVs, and they didn't take off either, did they? But it just seems to be struggling. It just seems to be struggling. And I just wonder whether it's the fact that people just don't want to wear these things for very long. No, uh, and and I think also you need regular breaks, unlike TV, yeah. radio, uh, podcasting, for that matter. Where VR is doing well is around training. So yes. when I was re- reading about it and researching, you know, I know that people, for example, working in healthcare, in engineering. So, for example, if you want to, if you need to be working on a uh, oil rig you know, offshore, you can actually have your induction whilst you're still on land using Uh, VR. So by the time you are on the platform, you are essentially much safer because you know your way around. Certainly you have memorized some of of the lessons. And of course, in the medical sector, people can practice uh, difficult operations and surgery uh, very safely. Yeah, it, it, it's it's incredible, and I, and I can see how that absolutely works. But in the mainstream, I guess, VR is just the mainstay of games, really, isn't it? We haven't seen any VR films. We don't see people wandering around um, stately <laughs> homes with VR headsets on, although they, they're, they're quite happy with the audio ones in stately homes. Very, very interesting. What do you think as well about YouTube bringing in five billion pounds in ad revenue in one quarter of the year i mean that is that is silly silly money telephone number money and 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 i have to say i i've i've noticed recently i i watch a lot of youtube um and i have noticed the adverts seem to have stepped up a bit they're much more intrusive than they used to be and sometimes they play two at the start of a video and if the video is quite a long one if it's longer than eight minutes the the adverts crash in at least every minute or every two minutes and I'm getting to the stage now where I'm even thinking about buying the premium version of YouTube just to avoid them. No, I mean you summarized pretty much how I feel about it I mean not to have to go through two adverts to frankly watch a pretty mundane uh, you know video I mean I'm not you know watching premium content as such but mm-hmm. if I'm watching a new uh, real for now that it is an hour too long i mean easily 20 20 adverts across the, the piece and uh, adverts that obviously are irrelevant to me as well so they're not there with their targeting but you remember last week we spoke about this issue with the uh, u.s elections where mm. they could not find this the space and time to place all the adverts i think there's there's some signals in there but i think youtube has to be careful you know they need to remember where they came from yeah and um whilst yes temptation may be for some to go for the premium service others will say Do you know what why don't i go elsewhere or which is the way this this is where they have to be very careful roger spend more time on social networks yeah and you know my youtube channel um hasn't got to the plat the uh the 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 cutoff point where i qualify to monetize my videos uh so i i haven't seen the the uh, functionality for myself but i do know that when you are a youtube creator you have the ability to choose whether you put the adverts at the start whether you allow them to interrupt during the middle uh, and whether they're actually pop-up ads you know banner ads and that sort of thing and i do sometimes wonder whether greed maybe takes over with some people who've got hundreds of thousands maybe millions of subscribers they must be making a fair amount of money from their channels now and the temptation must be to tick every single box and and maybe it's time for people to just to sit back and say well it'll be a little bit more engaging for my my subscribers if i sort of untick a couple of those boxes i might not make as much but i'll have much happier subscribers and ultimately happier subscribers for longer is probably what people want i would agree yeah so pascal great news items there really interesting stuff and some massive telephone number sized figures (laughs) to talk about i think it's time to move on to the content spotlight section of the show And in this section of the show, each week, Pascal and I pick an item of content that's caught our attention over the last seven days. It could be a video, it could be an article in an online magazine, it could be a podcast, it could just be 
a piece of content that we've stumbled across on Twitter. And each week we bring it to the show and surprise each other with this piece of content. So, Pascal, tell me, what have you got for me this week? So this week, uh, I'm going to try and surprise you by something that uh, I've gotten quite excited about. So for the last two, three weeks, Roger, as you well know, I've been batch recording the second season of the Content Marketing Studio. And a lot of the conversation has been around creativity, imagination, and in a way, being careful that you know current circumstances don't uh, hinder your your work as as a content creator. And I found myself, you know, in my coaching, asking people to find ways to have a positive mindset and looking at creativity and so on. So I'm thinking, I, I want to look this up a bit more. You know, this business of being creative and how does that work? Two days later, I was in the car coming back from the shops, I think, and. John Cleese, the actor, producer, and writer, is interviewed on BBC Radio 2. And it so happens that John Cleese has released a guide on creativity. And he spoke about it with such passion. I thought to myself, I've got to get a copy and I, I will probably learn from this. And to be honest with you, the content is so good, you could, you would think, you would imagine that this was actually written for marketers, for content ah. creators, Roger. I mean, honestly. And for that reason, I feel like maybe I'm cheating because I'm bringing a small book to the table uh, on Content Spotlight, <laughs> not the podcast, not an article and so on. And and I want to give a quick overview and I don't want to spoil the fun. So for our podcast listeners, I apologize in advance because I'm holding the book, obviously, uh, that people can sit uh, on as video. It's a small guide. It's almost like a travel journal, would you say, Roger? That looks like it, doesn't it? It looks like one of those... Um who somebody's moved my cheese books or, or something like that. That's right, yes. It's 100 pages. On the front cover, you have a caricature of John Cleese with some lemurs, his favorite um, animals, uh, pointing to the word creativity. And not only did he obviously release this book, and I think there's a lesson in there maybe for some of us about perhaps, you know, we have um, blog posts and articles on our website that could actually be repurposed into those guides and kind of travel journals. But he's also um, recently booked himself to do some online webinars about the content of the book. So I think maybe dip down John Cleese as a content marketer as well as being an <laughs> actor, whatever. So what I'm going to do today, Roger, if you'd allow me, I'm going to read out to you the chapters and the words in those chapters, once again, should resonate with you and our content creators out there. So chapter number one, the creative mindset. That gave me a shock because this is a title, my, the, chapter one of my workshop. So, but hey, you know, next chapter Hairbrain tortoise mind. Then we'll move on to quickly into tips and hints. These are the tips and hints and suggestions as written in the book. Write ahead about what you know. Looking for imagination. Making an imaginative leap. Keeping going. Coping with setbacks. Get your panic in early. I like this one. Your thoughts follow your mind. The dangers of overconfidence, testing your ID, kill your darlings, and finally seeking a second opinion. So if you think that these are the mini chapters and the content of that book, can you see why I almost think, my God, this was written for content marketers? Absolutely. Kill your darlings as well. I'm, I, I, I'm sure that him, that's him saying, if there's something you particularly like, but it's not working you should get rid of it as opposed to sticking with it because it's part of what you you actually like and I, i'm sure i read once that that was one of the things that he stuck to when he was writing his comedy scripts is you know you may have a piece that you absolutely love because you spent so much time crafting it but if it doesn't get a laugh it has to come out um so i i imagine that that's probably what that's that's about but i'm i'm thinking back pascal i'm i'm pretty sure that way back after Faulty Towers and when, when he was still acting, I'm sure John Cleese did a series of training videos, oh, he corporate, did, yes. tra corporate training videos <laughs> about how to give good customer service, probably as an offshoot of his Basil Faulty personality. No, I think you're right. I'm pretty sure I saw one around timekeeping because he did a movie actually um, around you know being late and 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 how rude that is and so on. So you know, to our viewers and listeners and to you, I hope that you don't think I've broken uh, too many rules by choosing a, a small book or a guide, as John Cleese would say. But I just got so excited, I felt that he was addressing me as a content creator and marketer. But that makes sense because ultimately, what we try and do here is bring the different, the diverse disciplines of book writing and video production 
production and, and radio production and so on into our work. Absolutely. I'm good. definitely going to find that because Cleese makes me laugh. You know, I can watch an episode of Faulty Towers that I've seen 50 times and it will still have me doubled up in painful laughter. It's just fantastic. So should I tell you a little bit about my piece of content? Please. Okay. Now, I have to I have to say, this is an article which um, appears in eConsultancy magazine, and the heading is Four Trends That Show How Influencer Marketing Has Evolved in 2020. Now, for many people, me included, influencer marketing does set off alarm bells. We have heard stories of, you know, sullen teenagers getting grumpy because they can't get a free meal at a three-star Michelin restaurant to post a picture on Instagram and, and, and all of that sort of thing. And, and, I, and I guess there is that, that perception in some quarters that influencers are just freeloaders who want free clothes, free stays in hotels and this, that and the other. Um, what what made me want to have a look at this particular subject was two things. First of all, this week, uh, my wife and I have been watching a series on Netflix. It's called Emily in Paris. Mm. I don't know whether you've seen the uh, the trailers for it. Now, the, Emily is played by Lily Collins, who is Phil Collins, the rock singer's daughter, which is quite interesting. And and and, pa- and Pascal, it's a bit of a vacuous program, I have to say. It's, it's light, light-hearted entertainment, but it's set in a marketing agency in Paris. I think they do a fabulous job of showcasing Paris. Some of the cin- cinematography is fantastic. So, if anything, it's worth watching uh, as a French person just to to get that uh, that beautiful uh, look at Paris. But influence come up, influence has come up a lot in this program, and, and I guess that the Emily of the of the heading of the of the series is an influencer in it. And, f- and funnily enough, she starts posting Instagram stories in the first episode, and she's got like three followers, and and. It, as the episodes go by, the follower count increases, and I think by episode 10, she's got about 100,000 followers, if only it was that easy. But there's one particular scene in that series, and this is what this article sort of highlighted for me, where a brand is about to launch, and they've invited a load of influencers into the room. Now, again, maybe they're caricatures, but a lot of these influencers, they're just there to see what freebies they can get. So they're going to get a free dress out of it. They're going to get a free, very expensive perfume. And the person who wins the contract is actually the one who shows a deep interest and understanding of the brand whereas a lot of the others turn up and simply just oh I've got a hundred thousand followers give me money give me money give me money and I don't know that much about influencer marketing but in any sort of marketing sphere the people who are going to be successful aren't the people who've got hundreds of thousands of followers it's going to be the people who genuinely show an interest in the brand that they're going to work with or the company that they're going to work with and this article actually backs that up now i'm having explained this to you pascal i'm thinking that maybe emily in paris should have been my content spotlight this week <laughs> but uh, you know what what the article is saying is that you know there's a lot of influence influencers out there on instagram and on youtube who have made a big living out of doing travel vlogs now of course travel has been utterly devastated by covid this year and and some of those travel vloggers some of those tra- instagram travel people have, have disappeared completely some of the other ones have pivoted i hate that word but there it is and they've sort of bought bought a camper van and they're driving around their home country in camper vans now and, and this article is basically saying what's changed as a result of covid in the world and what do influencers if you want to call yourself that need to do to alter their um, perceptions and there's a lot of talk about organic social traffic and being genuine and 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 not trying to you know not trying to be a a rock superstar and all of that sort of thing and and again I think the two things that come out for me is what I said before first of all it's it's all about making sure that it's not about you it's always got to be about the brand and and you know you can you can say that whether you're an influencer or if, if if you're just a a a personal brand it's not about you it's always about the customer and the second thing is that this article does highlight a shift 
away from sales driven campaigns more to a, the social good and and then again we're seeing i think a lot because of covid that our attention has been shifted towards poverty a bit perhaps and whereas some brands might have been focusing on just growth of sales now you're hearing a lot from charities who are helping people with their meals or feeding people who are who can't feed themselves and i think that's one of the strong messages that's come out of this article for me so i, d- I don't know actually now whether i'm recommending this article or, or i'm recommending emily in paris maybe maybe read the article and watch the series and see what you think <laughs> yeah in that order i think that'd be great so i mean listen you kind of push a bit of an open door for me because the term influencer um uh, is just something that has perplexed me for quite some time because for me uh, to begin with if I could find and meet the person who invented the term that day and then people essentially copied and pasted it you know all over <laughs> I'd be asking them you know what did you have in mind when you when you created that word because to me that doesn't exist that's that's not a function that's not a role you are a travel writer you are a fashion journalist you are a, a whatever a food critic you're not an influencer it so happens that the manner in which you do it nowadays is digital and and i think also for people who are very good at it you might be doing yourself a disservice and um I hope you don't mind me taking position on that one, Roger, but you know, you have to choose a profession, you have to choose an occupation, and you're not going to put influencer on your passport, are you? And so that said, there is obviously in all practices, you know, two camps, those who are essentially well-mannered and well-intentioned, and then those who are essentially poorly mannered and have got very poor intentions. And sadly, back to you know the the brand um the reputation of influencers right now the the story and the headlines are all about the bad behavior the kind of outbursts in restaurants and the demand you know via email to small businesses unless you give me a copy of your software i will essentially trash you on twitter and that reminds me a little if you don't mind me uh, roger the way in which pr agencies in london behave in the 90s why because i was on the receiving end of that behavior Behavior. And I think for you know all our great, great content creators and all those writers, critics, and passionate people, keep doing the work that you do. But if I may humbly suggest that you need to rename your occupation because this is not going to end well. And there we are. No, nice little rant there, Pascal. I absolutely agree with you. If you're a, if you think you're an influencer on Instagram, just call yourself a travel photographer. And as you say, if you are on YouTube and you do travel videos, call yourself a travel videographer. Don't call yourself an influencer. Good stuff, good stuff. I love it when you got on your soapbox, Pascal. (laughs) But I think we need to move on, and it's time to take a look at marketing tech and apps. In this section of the show, Pascal and I bring to the table a couple of apps or platforms or websites or pieces of tech, again, that have caught our attention over the previous week. Pascal, I always look forward to what you've got, so hit me with your marketing tech and apps for this week. All right, Roger. So I'm going to wrap up my kind of quest for information knowledge around Chrome extensions. I may come back to it, but you know, I want to kind of bring it to an end so I can move on to other themes. But those two were actually inspired by what happened to me the last couple of weeks in terms of working and the content creation. So I'm going to begin with uh, Vimeo Record. Now, Vimeo would be known to some as, some say, competitor to YouTube. But in fact, it's a very different platform where video producers and, and the likes can publish their work. And in fact, if you you remember, Roger, I started using Vimeo really before I used YouTube. And Vimeo released and adapted to the demands of the time a a Chrome extension whereby you can record your webcam and your screen and leave a message on Vimeo, your Vimeo account. So video messaging whereby, for example, if I was to receive an article or a video for me to review with my editor, Tim, instead of sending a long email, I can literally just record myself talking through the video, you know, frame by frame or step by step, and then he can watch the video on our Vimeo account privately and then make the corrections accordingly. So I know that there are other platforms out there, but um, I was very surprised, a pleasant surprise to get an email from Vimeo uh, two days ago saying, we've done this for you because we understand that you're working more remotely. We want to help your team. 
uh, reading the between the lines, I do think that people can use Vimeo Recall as a Chrome extension without necessarily having a, a paid for account because, like all platforms, Roger, you know, you can have a free Vimeo account and then you go up the um, the kind of the steps. So, um, if you've not done any th video messaging yet, but you want to try something really robust and safe, I think Vimeo Record could be a, a safe option for you. Next, I wanted to talk to you about, again, my work recently. You'll be pleased to know that after weeks and weeks of agony and and kind of, you know, uh, procrastination, I finally finished my fresh French, sorry, web pages. So, because, <laughs> you know, I've been working on those for quite some time. And I've been helped with um, my brother who uh, uh, works in France to, with a copy and so on. And I was working, obviously, on my WordPress website. I was, uh, I had obviously draft version of the web pages. But then, how do I show my brother what I've been up to, without you know him having access to it? It was all a bit, a bit tricky. And then I remembered a Chrome extension called, quite simply, Save to Google Drive. So it's an icon that you'll have on your Chrome extension, and whichever web pages you're looking at, if you click Save on Google Drive, it's going to save a, a PNG file of the whole web page, not just the picture you can see on your laptop screen. So that allowed me to work much faster with my brother to say, right, I think I've put the content in French as you wrote it. Here's a, a screenshot of the, the web page, but in full, so you don't have to scroll or do you know, several shots. What do you think? And he could then annotate you know, and give his comments on Google Drive. So save to Google Drive and Vimeo Record to help you work faster. Fantastic. I mean, the Vimeo record sounds a little bit like, I think there's something called Loom, isn't Correct. there? Correct. That's the same. Yeah. And, and, and Vidyard, Vidyard as well. And and all of these things have paid versions and, and uh, free versions. And, and uh, it's, it's good to know that Vimeo, I mean, they've got a strong history of video um, in, in production. So I'll definitely be checking out Vimeo record. Now, Pascal, a little bit of an apology, because I'm going to talk about something that I've already spoken about in an earlier episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. But I had to bring this back to the table today mm -hmm. because this is massive. This is, I'm just so excited about this. I talked about, it was way back, it was in the second or third episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast. I talked about the Apple Clips app. Now, the Apple Clips app was, it, it just allows you to make video, but it, the fabulous thing about Apple Clips is that it's got a built-in subtitling function, and it is so accurate. You lit literally film your video, and as you're speaking, the subtitles appear on the screen. And you can change the size of the subtitles and the font and all of that sort of thing. And yes, it does make the odd mistake. Um, even with my accent, it gets it mainly right. Uh, and But you can still go in and change it and... and, and uh, correct any typos and everything like that but the one massive problem with apple clips is that the video was square there was no portrait mode and there was no landscape mode and i remember saying on the show when i reviewed it last time that if they ever introduce landscape and portrait this will be literally hard to beat as your go-to video app for social media you know if you just want to record a quick video and put it on social media with subtitles this would be the go-to app but of course it's been square for about the last five years now last night pascal the little thing comes up on my phone update app and i see that there's an update for clips and you know where i'm going to go with this don't you we now have it portrait mode and landscape mode in the Apple Clips app, plus a complete revamp of the uh, of the interface, lots of new special effects, stickers. If you've got an iPhone um, 11 or or, or uh, an iPhone 10 onwards, you can either even superimpose the animal emoji over your head and and look like a cat or something if you so desire. But seriously, the subtitle feature of Apple Clips is just astonishing and now that we can do portrait and landscape mode i honestly go back to what i said before it will be the go-to clip the go-to app for creating video for social media it's absolutely fantastic well to our po so, podcast listeners if you could just imagine the grin and smile on uh, roger's face uh, which actually makes me even more jealous because of i'm the android phone user and we uh, don't have we just don't have something nowhere near as good 
as uh, Apple Clips. And now that you do portrait and landscape, well, yeah, uh, to be honest, that could be good enough for me to move to an iPhone. <laughs> I mean, I have I've been saying it for at least the last two or three years that I wish they would move on from just being <laughs> square. But oh, great, great app. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is again, it's something that I've gone back to to have a look at again after previously sort of dismissing it and it's a it's an it's an app it's a website and it's called if ttt uh, it just looks like a jumble of letters if ttt actually stands for if this then that and it, it's it's grown over the years it, it, initially it would allow you to create sort of rules so if somebody subscribed if somebody subscribed to you on youtube it would you you could send yourself an email or you could send somebody an email and that's what if this then that means you actually say if something happens in one app i can make it something else happen in another app and it was all right i used to play around with it you know if somebody followed me on twitter you could get it to send them a thank you message now some people would argue that that's that's you know that's quite um, intrusive but it was that sort of thing and after you've played around with it for a little while well I, I just sort of moved on but I have gone back to it recently now and it can literally do everything you know it's it's got the ability to go into Alexa and, and all of those sort of um, apps and platforms it can still do all the stuff on Twitter and YouTube if people follow you it can send you messages but you know it could even, if somebody subscribed to me on YouTube, it could get my lights to turn on in the fridge. I mean, it's as, it's as ridiculously <laughs> flexible as that. So you, it, it's literally a way of saying if, if something happens in one app or one platform over here, then it can make something else happen somewhere else. And once you get your head around that and start thinking about the implications, it does become quite powerful. And 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 I think it's probably worth having another look at now because it's really integrated into so much more stuff than it was when I first looked at it many years ago. Thank you so much for that reminder because you're right, I kind of was a bit dismissive in the early days because it felt like hard work. Yes. But actually, listening to you, Roger, I think all of us should kind of say, listen, we've, we've got enough going on in our lives that is super fast and productive. Why don't put a bit of effort into something that could be very powerful? So yes, you know, for our, you know, for those long winter days, you know, <laughs> why don't we all learn about FTTT? Fantastic. So again, some great apps to have a look at and to reconsider. I think it's time to move on, and should we dig out the DeLorean? Should we dig out our flux capacitor and go back in time and look at what was happening this week in history? And in 1867, the first stock ticker is unveiled in New York City. The advent of the ticker ultimately transformed the stock market by making up-to-the-minute prices available to investors around the country. In 1904, John Ambrose Fleming applies for a US patent on what he called the oscillation valve, the first example of the vacuum tube. Vacuum tubes would form the basis of electronic technology for nearly 50 years until the development of the transistor. Wow, but in 1928, Walt Disney's Steamboat Willie is released. This is the first Mickey Mouse cartoon with synchronized sound effects and was a huge success. But it would not have its theatrical release in Europe until 1931. In 1968, the Oakland Raiders score two touchdown in nine seconds to beat the New York Jets. But nobody sees it because they're watching the movie Heidi instead. Yes, they actually cut from the Super Bowl to a film and people missed those final goals. Well, in 1971, an advert in the magazine Electronic News announces the Intel 4004 or 4004, the first commercially available microprocessor. The 4004 was primarily used in calculator, but started a long lineup of Intel CPUs. In 1982, The Visitors by ABBA becomes the world's first commercial music compact disc to be manufactured. Since then, the album has been remastered three times, first in 1997, then in 2001, and again in 2005. 
In 1995, nearly six months to the day after Bill Gates sent his Internet Tidal Wave memo recognizing the importance of the Internet and only three months after releasing version 1.0, Microsoft releases Internet Explorer 2.0 for Windows 95. And sticking with Microsoft, in 2006, Microsoft releases their Zune Media Player intended to compete with Apple's iPod. Hailed by some as the iPod killer, the only killing done was by Microsoft itself less than five years later when they ended production of the Zune brand. Wow. <laughs> so can we, Ali, let's talk about this. Um, the Zune Media Player, yep. I have never come across the term uh, Roger. So I don't know what happened. What, what was that doing in 2006? But... And then five years later, it was killed. D did you know about it? I, I, I didn't know about this until I actually found this piece of news today. So they obviously had a massive success with it, didn't they? <laughs> well, maybe it was only the, the US. But um, so sticking with uh, Microsoft as a theme, this memo, the mm. Internet Tidal Wave, written by Bill Gates, you know, mm -hmm. obviously, mm -hmm. um, it, you can still find very, very poor copies of it. And it was like faxed uh, over fax uh, on the internet. And indeed, for our viewers and listeners, I'll put the link in the show notes to what we think is the official version. I mean, just to call it a memo, frankly, it's almost as long as the book that we mentioned by John Cleese. But um, <laughs> you know, it was such a visionary. I think he wrote a nine-page um, memo of you know, using, no doubt, Microsoft Office <laughs> to, yeah. the process. But what he was talking about, and I think was very important, is a need to adapt the fact that he was calling to his team leaders to be very flexible because frankly this was going to move very very fast and they'll have to change very often mm -hmm. and i wonder whether that's a telltale sign of you know moving from version 0.10 to 2.0 of their internet explorer because they were in a habit of changing quickly with the advance of the internet yeah, and and of course, I don't actually think Internet Explorer exists anymore. Um, I think they they have a new browser. It may even be called Edge, but uh, Correct, yeah, yeah, it just goes just goes to show how quickly things change. I, I wanted to go back and have a look at that 1928 Walt Disney Steamboat Willie. Do you know what really freaks me out about that is that it's nearly a hundred years ago. Oh, gosh, yes. Only eight more years, and it will be 100 years since that cartoon was launched. And, you know, I still watch quite a lot of Laurel and Hardy films, and, and some of those were made in the late 1920s, and they still stand up as genius items today. So it isn't going to be long before some of the films that, you know, that we started watching as children are, are getting close to being 100 years old. Now that you mention it, it's um, quite uh, something because, you know, this, I mean, Mickey Mouse, Disney's work, but also this cartoon is part of our culture you know, as, yeah. as, as a global population because, if, you know, it's known around the world. Interestingly, if um, you have uh, Disney Plus on subscription, you can go, they have a, a whole kind of collection, which is the archives, and you can watch Steamboat um, Willie. So I did so about a month ago. And okay, you know, it's it's tiny, it's grainy and so on because we're watching it on those, you know, super duper flat screens. But actually you sat there thinking this was the first cartoon with synchronized sound effects. Yeah. And that led to, you know, what we know today. And no doubt, you know, Disney inspired other filmmakers and creators out there. Absolutely. Yeah. We shouldn't we shouldn't write off any of this stuff because everything that we rely on today in film and media has its roots in things like that and and it's it's just really amazing to go back and and relive some of these things even if they are coming up to being a <laughs> hundred years old mm. so disney one of the best creators in the world let's bring it a little bit closer to home and move into our content shout out section In the creator shout-out section of the show, Pascal and I look at people from our close network, maybe a little bit outside our close network, who've been producing amazing content recently. And, as the name would suggest, we give them a shout-out. So, Pascal, who is in the spotlight this week? So, once again, it's all about new beginnings for me. You know I'm a romantic at heart when it comes to content creation. And it is someone that works in financial management and wealth management. Now, unlike you, Roger, you know, I don't have many contacts in the world of financial planning and the likes, but the rare few that I do know are always, you know, respect them and, and liked what they do. 
Richard Weatherburn, or Rich Weatherburn, as he <laughs> is like to be called as part of his you know, online branding, is a managing director of 313 Wealth Management and just recently launched his vlog and YouTube channel. And I want to celebrate that. So now Richard's been working in financial management and planning for over 15 years now. And he's bringing all that knowledge uh, into a mission to educate everyone in, on how to make money work for them. So I think he's used for several times financial education as part of what what he's doing so um i wanted to kind of let people know that he has started a vlog and is committed to releasing an episode every wednesday so nothing like you know doing it but this started and i think there's an important marketing lesson in this it started when he was essentially he opened a private facebook group called money masterclass and mm -hmm. within that people could ask questions safely and get some very straight to direct answer from rich and his team and he produced one video and the reaction was such that is it almost proved the concept they should do more so you know a hint for all of us do a prototype do something if you have access to community they will let you know whether it's worth continuing before you commit but it's gone commitment so what he's going to do is have a vlog every wednesday but also he's going to do something called the money masterclass so that one video is obviously worked well for him and he's going to be releasing a series of up to 14 episodes to really really get into the nitty-gritty on how to manage your money and he's promising simple stuff which will please you roger yeah. but yet very very powerful so the vlog, Money Masterclass, and thirdly, Money Talks, interviews, chats with entrepreneurs and people who want to describe their journey. Back to the vlog, because I know that you are a vlogger. Uh, so bless him for his very first episode. He may have chosen the coldest day in <laughs> Newcastle upon time, which you'll know all about, Roger, you know, uh, weather conditions and so on. So coldest and winter's day, but undeterred, he carried on. So it's lovely because it's crafted as a, as a day in the life of, but within that, which I think is very, very clever, is interspersed when he was recording Money Masterclass and Money Talk. So there's a bit of you know, teaser content into the other series as well. And so the style is great. I love the editing, the music, and also the dog makes an appearance. So what more would you want from, from the vlog series? So good luck to you, Rich and, and the team. And no, really, I wanted to celebrate new beginnings again. That's really good. I mean, a lot of people would probably not risk doing a podcast or a vlog in the financial services sector. I mean, it's it's never been the most interesting of subjects. But for that very reason, if you can crack it, you know, and Pete Matthew, a good friend of mine, his um, Meaningful Money podcast has got millions and millions of downloads. So, yeah, good luck, Rich. Good luck. I hope it works out well, because if you nail your content, you could grow really quite big in this area. So, Pascal, my shout out this week is for a gentleman called Matt Desmere. Now, Matt doesn't have a podcast. He doesn't have a vlog. He actually describes himself as a wise old uncle. Now, I met, I've met Matt a few times, funnily enough, at conferences in Eastern Europe. He always seems to be talking at the same conference that I'm talking at in Eastern Europe. So we've met each other in Macedonia and Albania and Montenegro. And he shares quite a lot of the same philosophies of, that I do, that marketing isn't just about communications, that you, you have to have a strategy first. I think back in the day, he used to run a very successful marketing conference uh, down in Poole in Bournemouth, uh, near Bournemouth, called Silicon Beach. So if anybody who's listening to the show can, rec can re remember Silicon Beach, then you know, give us give us a a comment in the uh, un underneath the video and and let us know because Silicon Beach, I think, was you know it was it was pretty much up there as one of the best marketing conferences in the UK at the time. Now, as I say, keep meeting Matt at these conferences, and whilst he doesn't have a a podcast or or a video series, he does post very thought provoking stuff on LinkedIn just in posts. And there was one caught my attention the other day, and it's sort of related to what we were saying earlier on about influencers. But it's not very long, Pascal, so I'm actually just going to read it out. I might miss out a little bit of it. But what he's saying is, getting hung up on personal branding is dangerous territory, or perhaps not dangerous territory, but certainly awkward ground. Businesses are not actually tangible things. They're a metaphysical construct we've created around systems and processes to enable financial 
financial transactions to happen and for profit to be legally made. Brands aren't actually things either. We've made those up too. We manufacture and engineer, subvert and cajole, cajole opinions to create a faux personality for this thing that doesn't exist in order to sell more than the competition. However, he says, people are real. They're not social constructs. People exist and their actions are real. When we start talking about personal branding, we're potentially creating space between the real us and the projected version of us, accentuating our good points and papering over our less desirable qualities. It's like we're giving ourselves an excuse for shitty behaviour. And he finishes off by saying, don't think about personal branding. Think about not being a dick. Think about <laughs> trying hard and doing your best. Think about being empathetic. Think about others. And I just love that. It's just a little bit of wisdom and it fits in with his wise old uncle personality. But going back to what we were saying earlier about influences, it is about, it's always about the customer. And I just love the way that Matt has positioned that. No, I think it's brilliant. And I think what he's doing as well, he's warning people about... So so personal branding, I think, was an expression that, that was claimed by entrepreneurs, solopreneurs, whatever you know term you, you favor, because they had to find a way to capture this idea of, I'm going to be myself, and that's what is going to be what essentially helps me secure work, because people connect with who I am. And I wonder what is warning us that maybe people are just moving away from over-engineering the personal branding. And importantly, Roger, I'm seeing more and more the bigger brands now forever messing it up for all of us by saying, I tell you what, this personal branding malarkey is not bad at all. Let's try and, and step into that and creating personas and figureheads in, in, in the business where, in fact, it should be the domain of the small business owner. Yeah, and also, you know, it's the same what you see in my vlogs and what you hear in this show is me. I don't put on an act. I maybe wave my hands around a little bit more than I do normally, but <laughs> it's me. And and I think that that is key to what, what Matt is saying here is if you are going to get out there, we want to see the real you. We know we, I don't want to see you on video, on stage, and then meet you behind the scenes and you actually turn out to be a bit of a prat and a, you know even or or rude or above yourself what we what we should see is what we should get and i think that's a really good lesson pascal we've been on a mission to keep things on track because we need to devote quite a lot of time to the next section of the show should we move on to film marketing or oh, please It's the film marketing section of the show, probably one of my favourite parts of the show each week, as you can tell by how excited we get. Now, you've probably noticed throughout Two Geeks in a Marketing podcast today, there have been a few little hints as to what's to come. We've kept mentioning the word mission. You know, Pascal and I are men on a mission, and we said earlier that our mission today, should we choose to accept it, was to give you some amazing content. Well, the film that we've chosen to talk about today is Mission Impossible Fallout. Now, this was the sixth Mission Impossible film starring Tom Cruise, and it's an absolute belter. It's just one of those, it's probably one of the most action-packed movies that I've ever seen in my life. And Tom Cruise, as we know, does the majority of his own stunts and and I sit there in the cinema being awe inspired by the stunts that I'm seeing but also thinking how on earth did he do that and he still lived to tell the tale so Pascal Mission Impossible Fallout what oh do we think? what a fine choice what a fine <laughs> choice Roger and you know that is incredible because this franchise I mean started as a TV series which I adored as a child then in 1996, if memory serves, we got this big surprise hit with um, a much younger Tom Cruise, but still um, kind of relaunching, you know, the whole franchise for for the big screen. And it's just, you know, has been sustained, you know, the excitement every time. And, you know, we wait patiently and impatiently for, for the next one. And it's hard to believe that this is the sixth one we're talking about. Um, just a quick nod to the fact that, you know, they are starting pl um, filming again on 7 and 8, which they're going to be running concurrently. 
And it's just an incredible uh, adventure story. But I think where the reason why it's working is because over the years, we've come to really love the characters. And I can remember that series from the, it was probably from the 60s, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it always used to make me laugh because they would they would have the the masks, which is is a big thing in the um, uh, Mission Impossible franchise. But of course, in the sixties, you'd have an act, a normal actor walking around with his own face, and then they'd cut to a shot of a very badly prepared piece of plastic being ripped off somebody's face, and and the illusion was just totally totally um, ruined. But of course, in the Mission Impossible films, they do it so magnificently well that sometimes. Even when you watch the films again, you forget who's got the mask on, who's not got the mask on. And then when they do the little, they pull it off. Oh, it's just it's just great. Love, mom- love moments like that. And, and I think that's part of you know the, the branding. We're going to talk about marketing in a moment, Roger, but the branding. Yeah. You, you get, obviously, the, the naming and the calligraphy. So it's always mission, mission, call on impossible, and then the qualifier. And they've used you know, all sorts of things. You've got the masks. You've got the, the car chases and motorbike chases. I think by now they must have used every single form of transport bar yeah. submarines. And maybe they have, I've forgotten, where somehow... You know, Tom Cruise is always dangling off a helicopter, an aircraft, or, or or whichever. But at the heart of it is essentially looking at the the main character of Ethan Hunt, dealing with pressures from you know both dark forces, evil forces, but also internally. I mean, in the case of Fallout, I mean, this poor guy has already saved the world five times, and yet the CIA had the audacity to suggest that he's not you know one of the team. I know, and and that is, if there's anything that is frustrating about these films, it's that, isn't it? It's it's just, there's always an authority figure in the film who distrusts Tom Cruise's character, Ethan Hunt. And, and I'm the same as you. I'm sitting there thinking, for goodness sake, give the guy a break. He saved the world so many times, and you're giving him this hassle. You're, yeah. a, bu- you're a bureaucrat, just shut up. Shut up, shut up. And, but I guess that's part of it, isn't it? It's part of the charm. And if, I mean, if uh, Tom is listening, you know, I have the number for ACAS because <laughs> I have to tell you, I think IMF is a very, very bad employer. You need to kind of sort this out. So very quickly for our viewers and listeners, you know, filming started in Europe in 2017, April 2017. Um, I think the production team seems to like Europe a lot because Roger, London and Paris have been featured, you know, a lot, you know, in, in the films. We all know because I made a part that was part of the, um, I suppose, the PR in elements that Tom Cruise got injured in London whilst jumping between two buildings. But then again, you know, what was it? What was he thinking? Uh, the injury and the video clip has been watched perhaps more often than the trailer itself of <laughs> his uh, um, ankle being twisted in, in the wrong direction and yet still running on the rooftop to get the, to get the shot. Yeah, I mean that is just dedication, isn't it? I I'd also read, you know the you know the bit in the film where he skydives out of the aeroplane um, and I think the way they did it is that he's running towards the camera and whoever was holding the camera went out the plane backwards so that he could oh. effectively. Now it's just an in- astonishing shot and we do know that Tom does his stunts as you say, but apparently they shot that over 200 times. Now, I don't know whether that's an urban myth or not. I'm sure it's true. But just imagine, I'd be, I, I wouldn't do it once, but he, to get the perfect take, yeah, that, up in that plane and dived out of it over 200 times. That famous um, halo drop, yeah. I mean, they, they rehearsed several times a day because they wanted to make it a, um, a, a sunset shot. So then they only had one or two uh, takes. So that, that went on for, for weeks and, and the, he trained f- for an entire year like he always does. So because of the delays, um, post-production you know, t- was delayed and they literally finished the film in terms of cutting it three weeks before the premiere. So Ooh. that that close. So Roger, when you think sometime that you know your vlogging is a bit tight <laughs> you, can, you can have some sympathy that even tom cruise can sometime you know find it difficult my goodness three weeks to go I, I'll, I'll never be rude about premiere pro again <laughs> <laughs> okay so let's move on to the marketing for our viewers okay. and listeners so what we've done for you roger and i've done some research and we've kind of taken bits and organized them in the order of of, of events so we begin the marketing of mission impossible fallout in January 20, 2018, with Tom Cruise himself releasing pictures on Instagram and on Twitter, creating essentially a tsunami of reaction on, on, on the internet. 
And the first trailer was released on February the 4th, 2018, during the Super Bowl. And the second one came out in May 2018. Marketing spend was $140 million on global promotion and advertising. That's uh, just to, for, for you to put a measure into it, you know, that's literally uh, a fifth of the overall budget for the entire film. So that's wow. that's a scary money. So how do they use the money, Roger? Well, to begin with, we had, we'd be treated to different posters from February to May 2018. And I must confess, Roger, at the time, I wasn't sure about those posters. And the reason for that is I felt that they were too much like Jack Richard, and that concerned me a little. But also, some of it felt a little like Mission Impossible 2, which I think is the weakest of the franchise. And the reason for that, in my view, humbly, is because uh, the character Ethan Hunt is on his own, as opposed to the ensemble you know, yes. uh, storyline. Um, but, you know, my, my concerns were completely misplaced because it was absolutely fine. But did you have a favorite poster by any chance? Uh, I, maybe I was a little bit like you, to be honest, Pascal. I, I did think there was, a, you know, the one where uh, there's almost like a silhouette of Tom Cruise, to me, looked like a Bond-type poster. So, yes, they did look a little bit, but I guess the one that always dry, got my attention was the one of him diving out the plane. <laughs> I just can't get away with the, the from the scariness of that particular thing. So it had its... World premiere in Paris on July the 12th, 2018. <laughs> Here we go back to Paris. Emily's still in Paris. And it came out in the States on July the 27th. So quite a quite a gap there. It was the first in the series to be released in Real, Real, Real D3D and also had an IMAX release as well. Yeah, I don't remember. Unfortunately, I, I don't think I saw the 3D. Uh, so it would have been IMAX for me or just normal normal Max. <laughs> yeah, we saw it in 3D. And, uh, you know, again, 3D is one of those things I can give or take. But it was genuinely breathtaking 3D. Now, from a film marketing segment point of view, Roger, I want to pose here and just bring our attention to the fact that there was a lot of, there was a lot of pre-launch marketing. And, and I wonder whether a hint for all of those content creators is sometimes we're all so busy in producing the content that we don't do enough of that teasing of that kind of uh, forewarning. Um, so, for example, someone could be working indeed on a vlog or on an article. Nothing stops you from taking your mobile phone and taking a screenshot of your computer screen and coming soon. Nothing stops you from creating indeed a teaser poster but quickly jumping on Canva. And, and so I'm using this as a reminder that sometimes let's be careful. We need to make sure that there's a lead up to the to the uh, to the release of, of the content the main the main event the main event mm. so and then post event they had fun with the content now that it's been released the one that uh, i thought was so so clever and i would say almost ahead of its time is that paramount the production distribution company um partnered with a company called gifcat and what they could do is a 360 loop a gif of inside the helicopter that very famous scene where there's this kind of incredible helicopter chase in the mountains mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so literally with your phone or whichever you can do a full 360 inside the helicopter being um, piloted and flown by tom cruise ethan hunt and for me it was this idea of you know so they must have thought about it whilst filming the the, the film before uh, it was just that kind of pre-production and and it looks great and it's, it's good fun to use and again very very much viral content i think that that's such a good lesson isn't it because it was it had to be planned in it had to be planned in and, and i often find with myself if i'm down if i'm out in edinburgh shooting a video i'll often get home and think oh do you know what i should have done this or i should have done that and the reason is I didn't plan it properly. I just headed in there with the camera and, and winged it, basically. So, yeah, the planning is absolutely spot on. This movie was also among, amongst the first advertisers to use Pinterest's full-screen promoted video units right. as well. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah. So, again, I mean, oh, would you love to be in that marketing meeting with um, <laughs> with uh, Tom. I, mean, I don't know, would you attend the marketing meeting? I don't know. But anyway, it would be just, you know, all those ideas and because, you know, you've got all the content. So the other thing that they did, which I'm a big, big believer in, although that moment is very difficult, is that they took the footage to essentially uh, events like CinemaCon mm. or Cine Europe and mm. the Cannes Festival, you know, all those things. But they went there to talk about their content. And I wonder whether, again, lesson for all of us, when we can network again or when we actually go online to virtual conferences to one, should we be less timid about giving our content a big shout out? 
It's a very good question, isn't it? You, you, you don't want to give away the secret sauce. And, and, and what they also did is that, you know, that the, there was a load of video featurettes mainly focused on the stunts, wasn't it? And, and you could argue, well, is this actually going to ruin it for people watching the film? Almost like giving away the secrets in advance. But it didn't It didn't affect my enjoyment of the film. I still had my jaw literally dropping through the floor at many, many points during the film. So I, I'm not sure that that actually caused them a problem. No, and bear in mind that the film is nearly um, you know, two and a half hours. I'm sure there's plenty to choose from without spoiling <laughs> the plot or whatever, you know, which again was a great, great story. And just on the uh, featurettes, one thing they did, which um, I, I don't see people do very often, uh, again, is creating exclusive content for particular you know, channels. So they did uh, one for just the IMAX. So if you want the IMAX, just for something just unique to to you as, as a viewer. Also Fandango, which is obviously a streaming platform, and ESPN, they had their own kind of specific exclusive content. And, and I'm thinking, hmm, let me go away and think about this one, Roger, whether I could do that in future with my own video series, offering something unique to some um, kind of hubs online. Yeah, I mean, again, you know, we, we talk about the, the marketing of these films because we love watching films. But every time we have these conversations, Pascal, there is always those little golden nuggets in there that we can learn from. And, and, and even that idea of just, you know, showcasing stuff as you produce it, teasing it, it's 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 such a good way to grow engagement and to grow your audience as you're putting your content together. And I think that's where on social media, I think stories as a feature are really well placed for that. And then the final bit I'm going to mention to you, Roger, when it comes to marketing, it's supposed to follow the journey from you know, the, the first Instagram post from Tom Cruise all the way to the release of the um, DVD, Blu-ray box set and so on. If you think that the movie was premiered you know, in, in the summer of 2018, the movie was made available literally in November as uh, as on streaming and then as a um, kind of hard copy Blu-ray DVD in December. That's no time whatsoever. And I like that because as a fan, you know, I don't want to wait an entire year to get my hand on a copy of the DVD. You, you know, I was there on the day watching it on the big screen. You've got my money. You've got my, my kind of, um, you know, fandom. Reward me as you've done by two months later, I've got a copy and I can get excited watching it again. I think that this is, again, it's textbook, isn't it? Engage your customers. And yeah, we were straight out there, bought the Ultra HD Blu-ray, <laughs> uh, literally watched the film again in the comfort of our own home less than two months after seeing it at the cinema. But if it's a massive, massive blow, and I know we've got the COVID issue at the moment where not as many people can go to the cinema, but when things are back to normal, you know, if the majority of people go to see it in that first month or six weeks or whatever it is, then in reality, you're not losing anything by getting the Blu-ray out there or the streaming version out there as soon as possible. Now, we're not going to go down the rabbit hole of saying, we'll just get the Blu-ray and, and, and out at the same time as the cinema so we can all watch it rather than delaying it. But I think that swift follow-up is just absolutely spot on. And they did it really well with this film in time for Christmas. And I wonder whether our friends, Amy Woods, you know, who is also a huge movie fan, would even consider that, you know, don't delay your repurposing. You know, from Amy Woods from Content 10X. Yeah, uh, I think I still have tendency to want to almost you know get on with what I do, release you know the uh, the interviews, for example, that I've done on video, and it feels like I need to let it uh, leave it for a while before I consider repurposing. And I wonder whether the hint is, well, don't wait too long because you may capture a different audience by doing things very differently. Yeah, yeah. Do you know the only downside for me? with Mission Impossible, um, Mission Impossible Fallout, is that how on earth can they possibly top it? And you said already there's two more in production, which suggests that they're going to be bigger, more exciting, with more incredible stunts. And yet Fallout was just, to me, was one of the best action movies of all time. So, wow. It, I know. Wow. <laughs> And, you know, every time you watch a Mission Impossible, you go, crikey. I mean, to be honest with you, when they released a Ghost Protocol mm. and Tom Cruise was dangling on the on the Burj Khalifa, you know, oh. and I was thinking, wow, I mean, how are they going to top that? And, and every time, every time. And one thing that I like about Mission Impossible, albeit it is fiction work, clearly, and the characters are larger than life, is they've got very, very good villains. 
I mean, yes. in the case of both Rogue Nation and obviously um, Fallout, you know, that very, very sinister villain, which I think was superbly acted. And it's a lot more grounded than the Fast and Furious franchise, which I love all the same, but we are in kind of almost graphic novel territory. Whereas with Mission Impossible, we are, uh, you know, for all its fiction work, it feels a lot more grounded and feels dangerous as a result. Yeah, now, I, ultimately, some of, the, some of the stunts, as we said, unbelievable. But there's always that realism about Mission Impossible, isn't there? Especially the the scenes where he's having to break into some impenetrable safe, <laughs> or he's got to try and dangle himself down into some museum or something like that. It, there's a believability about it, as well as it being outrageous. And I think that that's what makes it so good. Yeah. That's what makes it so good. Do you know, Pascal, we could probably talk for another couple of hours about this film on its own. But time is short. Time is short. So I'm going to bring this episode of Two Geeks and a Marketing Podcast to an end. Hope you've enjoyed the show. Thank you for watching. Thank you for listening. Please do subscribe to the YouTube channel or to the podcast on all the platforms where you consume your podcasts. Do please leave us comments and suggestions. If you want us to talk about a specific film, let us know. This is the, this is your show. Tell us what you want us to talk about. Until next time, get out there and make sure that your marketing is done right. I was Roger Edwards. He was Pascal Fintonio. And this podcast will self-destruct in five seconds. <laughs>